Good afternoon again. I think I'd like to get everybody started, so if you could take a seat, um, we'll begin the next program. Uh, I am Melissa Lanning. I'm Associate Dean from the University of Louisville Libraries, and I'm really delighted to introduce the next program to you. Um, before I get started, however, I want to acknowledge and recognize Bonnie Smith, who is my co-planner for this particular program. Um, it, we just had a great time working on it together, and um, that was part of the whole experience being here today. When Bonnie and I agreed to start working on this program um, uh, and developing uh, something around the Ithaca SNR report on inclusion, diversity, and equity, our initial conversations were leading us in a direction that probably would have resulted in a fairly conventional academic analysis of the report. Um, we had a list of potential speakers in mind. Many of them would be very familiar to you in the room. But as we talked more about it, we realized that part of this symposium and part of the reason that we wanted to be here today is a call to bring different perspectives and different voices into the conversation. And so really, we had, to, we had to think very hard about the direction we were going in. And so we went back to the drawing board. And the program that we have here to, for you today is the result of that further reflection on what that means. Um, you received information uh, prior to the program, including extensive bios. So I won't repeat that here for you now. But I will tell you a little bit about the format of the program and what you can expect. Our first speaker is Brian Lim. He's Dean of University Libraries at Adelphi University. Um, he's going to provide his perspective on the Ithaca report uh, from uh, as an administrator and also as a participant in the study that was uh, then became the results of the report. In addition, he's going to identify three challenges that emerge from that report in terms of what we need to do in, within academic libraries to, in, to move, um, move past where we are, past the status quo for diversity and inclusion in academic libraries. Following Brian's talk, uh, Varajita Singh, who is Assistant Vice Provost in the Office of Equity and Diversity at the University of Minnesota, will provide an overview of design thinking, which uh, her discipline is architecture. So it's a methodology that she draws upon from her, for her discipline, and she will talk about how you can use design thinking to address the challenges of equity and diversity that I think we realize we all face. Um, so that's going to be part one of the program. Part two, it follows the break, and if, for those who are interested, part two will be back in this room. It's one of the concurrent sessions and where you will actually have an opportunity to work through some guided exercises around those des uh, design or uh, challenges that have been identified. And so if you are interested in being involved in that part of the program, please come back to this room after the break at, at 3.30. Uh, I think that's really all I want to say. Just one final note, though, before I turn it over to uh, Brian. Uh, many of you have probably participated in planning conference calls with people that you don't really know or have never met before, and how awkward and challenging those can be. And I have to say, that was absolutely not the experience working with Brian and Varajita. They immediately dug in with the ideas that Bonnie and I were putting on the table. They molded them and shaped them into something far better than we ever would have come up with on our own. And so I'm very appreciative to both of them for that. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa, for such a wonderful introduction and setting the tone for today. And thanks, Bonnie, your co-conspirator, in bringing us into this program. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I'm not an ARL director. I'm not at an ARL institution. However, this report really spoke to me. How many of you participated in the survey? Great. Um, and I won't ask how many have read it. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is provide you what I call the Reader's Digest version first. Does that betray my age? Do, does everyone know what that <laughs> reference means? OK, good. They're all librarians. <laughs> Uh, so I was honored to be asked to, well, participate in the survey. I, I received, you know, the email from Roger Schoenfeld of Ithaca and SNR, as all, all of you have, uh, to 
um, participate in this wonderful, thought-provoking um, survey and report. And what I'm going to do is say first that the invitation to participate came at a perfect time for me at uh, Adelphi University. Adelphi University is located in the New York City metro region. We're about 25 miles from Manhattan. We are a 100-year-old liberal arts-based institution um, that has now a graduate program that's been in place for at least 50 years um, in, a, in a variety of subjects and disciplines. We are an institution that is really pivoting from being a primarily white-serving institution to one that is becoming much more diverse. And so under our new strategic plan, under the leadership of our first woman president, Chris Reardon, we embarked on a strategic initiative to really focus on diversity and inclusion of faculty, staff, and students. And I was heavily involved in this effort and because there had been an opening in my library because as many of you are experiencing, you're seeing attrition in, in your ranks due to retirements and all of that. The baby boomer was leaving positions. There was an opening for me to recruit library faculty. Um, and so I eagerly dug into what the university was giving us administrators in terms of tools to do outreach to really look at the national level candidates that we could bring in with the least amount of prejudice about who should be at Adelphi. And I successfully brought in diverse candidates. And as a university, we brought in the most diverse uh, cohort of faculty ever at the university. 45% of our new faculty uh, that came in this academic year are people of color. And we are about to replicate that next year. It's been a hard lift, but it's been fun. Um, and the other thing that really sang to me in, with, with this participation and survey and report is that obviously I'm a rara avis. Okay, I hope you all know what that means. <laughs> okay, I'm a rare bird in academic librarianship. I'm an Asian American gay man in a position where there are mostly women and, or men who are white. And I fi have always found myself as the outsider, the marginalized person, but in a room like this. But I've always felt welcome. I'd, I've never actually felt marginalized or, 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 or to, to an extent that I have in other forms. And so I felt very personal, a personal investment in participating. And I'm also presiding over a predominantly white staff. Um, and that is in comparison to an increasingly diversifying student body. 46% of our students are, are uh, students of color. And we are on our way, we hope in three years, to become qualified to be a Hispanic-serving institution. So that's the personal context that draws me in. And here's the report itself. Um, you've all read it. There's the URL in case you need to get back to it. Now I want to give some, some pro provisos about this report. ARL and non-ARL libraries were surveyed. It was a massive, comprehensive survey, but the most robust results came from the ARL participants. So as you know, you should know, the report just focuses on a subset of the entire surveyed population. Um, so it just covers the error respondents. Now the error respondents have a lot of employees that are part of the academic library workforce, so that gives this report some heft and some, some um, universality. And certainly when, at, when I received the report back, or received the analysis that Roger and his team did about the employee demographics of Adelphi University, the, re the results were, frankly, very startling to me, but not unsurprising. And the results showed me um, that my library is just like all the other libraries that were reported in this a ARL uh, um, survey report. Um, key findings, 
again, not surprising. We are all familiar with the kinds of national surveys that are being done about our profession. Um, the majority of our overall employee uh, base are non-Hispanic white, 71%. 82% of li librarians are non-Hispanic white. And in this survey, as you saw, librarians are defined in quote marks. Um, uh, Ithaca you know, coded librarians as those having MLS degrees and those employees occupying certain positions that are librarian-like or li librarian identified. And further up, 89% uh, of library, library in leadership and administration are non-Hispanic white. Again. Are you surprised? I, I'm not. Um, now, the other surprising kicker, if you read into this report, is their own statement that it was the most diverse ARLs which provided the responses to the survey. So the estimates the, of, of uh, people of color versus, versus non-people of color are overestimated. So in other words, we can look at the report and say they've overestimated the number of and proportion of not of people of color of the underrepresented in the report. So what we may be looking at are actually the best case scenarios that we're or the worst case. Um, and as you go up the chain, as you go up the hierarchies in academic libraries, the 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 top level hierarchies, the exempt senior levels are primarily homogeneously non-Hispanic white, and the lower levels, uh, the non-exempt, uh, non-supervisory positions represented in column two, the second column, are less white. Whereas gender ratios are fairly, fairly constant, and I use that word carefully. You can see that according to the study, uh, Let's see, 61% of the academic library workforce at the ARL respondents are women. However, if you look at each level of each category, broad category of, of position here, you'll, you'll see some fair consistency across the levels, except when you get to the very end, when you see that there's a little dip at exempt senior uh, level, that women are less represented at that level than the other ones. And I bring this up because that wasn't really brought up in this report, but I know that gender representation, gender uh, is an issue for some, and maybe many, as reported in the, in, in, on Twitter and social media and in the academic literature, uh, that are women really truly represented uh, at the top levels? I don't, I don't know, I'm not sure if these, these stats are very conclusive, but. According to them, it, it's, the ratios are fairly con constant. The real problem, the real issue, as, as all of us have seen, is that the racial bifurcation, racial slash ethnic bifurcation, occurs most glaringly when you look at the types of jobs across the libraries. So if you look at the bottom half of this chart, you'll see that on the left-hand side, and the red, the red bars represent on the left-hand side, the most professional, the highest level librarian-like positions in the libraries. The ones on the, and that's where whites predominate. Towards the right side, uh, the lower bars on the right side represent the support level positions, facilities, access services, um, operational, uh, uh, kinds of positions. So we're seeing that there is a trend uh, or uh, here of increasingly non-white Hispanic and higher level jobs and people of color in the lower level positions. And maybe I shouldn't use lower level, I just should say support level positions. I don't think this includes student workers, but I think we can think of student workers also maybe as another iteration of this study and probably see student workers as possibly a diverse element in this chart. So that was really what I saw from the survey results that they did based on employee demographic analyses. Uh, the other part of the survey was attitudinal. They asked all of us, library directors, those who participated in the survey, what we thought about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uniformly, library directors 
perceived that their libraries are more, more equitable than the overall academic library community. Again, not surprising. I think most of us are probably uh, like-minded in that regard. We think uh, very highly of our own libraries, our own institutions and as being highly diverse. I mean, that's, I think, was my response, frankly, uh, until I got the results back, which confirmed something else. Uh, <laughs> And that's my own gap, you know, I, you know I, and I have to be self-reflective. As I go through this, I have to be self-reflective. Even though I'm a person of color, I'm a marginalized person, I'm part of a profession that maybe imagines itself differently. We have to imagine ourselves as who we are and recognize who we are right now and look at our institutions right now as, as what they are. So some of the telling findings from this report was in terms of the ad, attitudinal uh, um, data was that library directors at the libraries which are whitest, that is uh, the largest numbers of non-Hispanic non whites, perceived their libraries to be more equitable and diverse in greater margins than those library directors at uh, libraries that are truly diverse or more diverse and that was uh, and they also perceived these same directors who at the widest libraries perceived that their libraries were much more equitable and inclusive than the overall library community uh, and that told me that there is really a metacognitive gap that a lot of us have and it doesn't matter if you're a person of color or not. I think a lot of us have it because uh, just of our acculturation as librarians and our, our, our grand expectations for what we think libraries should be and who we should be as library directors. Um, I, I went into this profession because it's noble and everything about it is noble. Um, but now the scales are falling off my eyes. I'm thinking all of us are starting to question the, the, the perceptions we have about the nobility of what we're doing and that everything is perfect and everything is good. Um, rightly, most perceive that there are barriers to achieving racial and ethnic diversity in, in, their, in libraries, um, in their own libraries, and they see that, that uh, those barriers are at the application level, and most of the directors thought that, or think that, uh, it's geography which is the uh, in barrier. But we see from the Ithaca report that regardless of whether a library is in, or located in an urban or suburban location, the proportion of white employees is about the same, 71%. So geography is not really a barrier. I mean, this, that's what the data is telling me. So. In some ways, framing the issue is, is just so easy, it's so obvious. There is a lack of racial and ethnic diversity among librarians and senior leadership in libraries. And I want to frame this issue by underscoring the fact that, of course, as we all know, our student bodies, our student enrollments are increasingly diverse across the board. We're seeing more uh, people of color African-Americans, Latinos, uh, Native Americans, Asian-Americans um, filling our classrooms. And the diversity that we see in our classrooms and our campuses is not reflected in the diversity of our libraries, of our overall university workforces. Um, and this report focuses primarily on really one kind of diversity. You know, it's racial and ethnic diversity, and that's because the, that's what <coughs> Ithaca could collect, and that's what our HR departments, and that's what the federal government is collecting in terms of data about our workforces. It's racial and, and, and ethnic demographic data. But that doesn't mean that there is, uh, there is other kind of diversity that we need to be mindful of. And they do mention, through the report, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, you know, trans status, queer status, uh, religion, um, veteran status, 
disability, uh, and I think I would add age in there. I'm not, I don't think age is there. But because of the nature of the demographic data that's available to HR departments, to the federal government, and to us and to SNR, the focus has been primarily on this one kind of data point in terms of diversity. It's racial slash ethnic. That's not to diminish that racial slash ethnic is an important kind of diversity to be concerned about. But it's one that we can act on today. And speaking of acting on this, these issues of uh, barriers to diversity in academic libraries, we have to think about the extrinsic factors that are there. You know, this morning, DeRay McKesson eloquently spoke about the systemic structural things that we have to think about, the levers that we have to pull to change society, to change culture, to make everything work the way we want it. And I have to, you know, remind ourselves that some consider librarianship a white profession. There is a, uh, our article in, uh, um, or a blog post, I guess, article in, in, in The Librarian with a Lead Pipe, uh, recent contribution by a April Hathcock, I think that's how I pronounce her name, The Whiteness of Librarianship, I think that was the title, and it was eye-opening for me. And for ethnic minorities, for underrepresented folks who are from disadvantaged backgrounds, do they perceive librarianship as a white profession? Is that the barrier that we have to deal with first before addressing anything else? Um, and we see, uh, evidently, a diversity lag in LIS enrollments, and that's report been reported in the literature and, and in many studies. And if not geography, what are the other kinds of barriers that we have to consider at the university level? Our libraries do not exist alone apart from the university or college ecosystem. Are there issues of compensation for librarians and other staff? Um, is there, are there issues in institutional reputation and uh, lack of student diversity? Those all factor in. So I leave us with the challenges that we have to think about, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today, the intrinsic challenges that we can focus on and maybe do something about to remedy the situation. And that is, number one, consider attitudinal change. How might we see more clearly the gaps present in equity, inclusion, and diversity in our own organizations and inspire attitudinal change in library leadership and all of our employees. All of our employees have some kind of leadership capacity or function, whether they're actually given the title of leader or dean or whatever, or director or not. What about the retention of our underrepresented employees who are already working for us, who are already in our departments, who are in those support level positions? And that not only includes regular employees, but student workers. How might we foster equity inclusion and achieve retention of those underrepresented individuals? It could be librarians and from other professions or other professionals. How do we promote underrepresented employees? Well, how do we retain that group first? And how do we promote um, our underrepresented employees? How might we create an internal pipeline through development and promotion of existing employees, support staff, et cetera, to MLS positions and senior leadership? And I put in parentheses, MLS not required. Um, I recently read uh, David Lewis's Reimagining the Academic Library, and his assertion is that the number of academic librarians will probably be remaining level, constant. But where we're going to see the growth in our workforce is in those other positions that require expertise, but that expertise doesn't necessarily require an MLS. So thank you for uh, letting me express my comments and thoughts about the report, and I want to turn it over to Virajita. Thank you, Dean, 
Brian Lim. Use the mic. <laughs> That's the first step. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes. okay? Thank you, Dean Brian Lim, for your excellent introduction to the Ithaca Report and the insights into equity, diversity, and inclusion context and challenges facing research libraries and other libraries across the nation. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you to Bonnie Smith and Melissa Lanning. Uh, and as you mentioned, it's been a great pleasure to collaborate with you and Brian to plan this session and also the next session that follows this, this one. Um, I wanted to start a little bit um, talking about my work in equity and diversity to, to connect to some of the things that Brian has mentioned and then I'll switch to the uh, presentation on design thinking. So libraries in general are a very important institution in our uh, United States society. As once an immigrant graduate student uh, to this country 20 plus years ago, the public libraries in the United States um, have been very, an invaluable resource for me and my family. Simultaneously, in the same time frame, I experienced an exemplary research library, specifically the University of Minnesota libraries, as a critical um, experience for my own education, teaching, and research. Are there uh, members from the University of Minnesota libraries here today? Okay, I see a few of you there. Welcome. Um, I guess I have had the pleasure of partnering with the University of Minnesota Libraries in many contexts over the years, including a more recent opportunity in developing the University of Minnesota's first open access journal, the Interdisciplinary uh, Journal of Partnership Studies, on which I serve as an editorial board member. And speaking of equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, a lot of work is to be done in the context of libraries, but I'm also happy to report what I see at our university is that university libraries has taken the lead in bringing some issues um, of social justice. Um, their recent exhibit, which is now online, and I highly encourage you to check it out, is called a Campus Divided, Progressives, Anti-Communist, Racism, and Anti-Semitism at the University of Minnesota from 1930 to 42. Um, it was a really powerful exhibit and brought to the fore um, uh, something that many campuses are grappling with the racism uh, in their own history. Uh, it's led to some difficult and uh, um, serious conversations about where universities should uh, move forward in some of the naming of our buildings and so on, which is, and it's still underway. So the work of equity and diversity and inclusion in higher education is complex. At the University of Minnesota, um, through the Vice Presidential Office for Equity and Diversity, we have a comprehensive vision framework to inform the work, um, which is very broad and includes community engagement and so on. But to operationalize this work and make it simple and easy for all of us to um, understand on campus, um, we have organized it into three strategic priorities. The first is um, increasing representational diversity, and that's uh, what Brian referred to as well, is that we need to continue to grow more diverse. Um, the second is improving campus climate, uh, which is we must is address issues of climate that are key to retaining our diverse students, our faculty, and our staff. And that gets to the re retention challenge again. Um, uh, we, we can continue to bring people on uh, increasing our representational diversity, but it's a revolving door if people don't feel welcomed and can't stay. And then the third direction we have is um, in leveraging strategic partnerships and initiatives. And that really connects uh, to the idea that we can't do this work alone uh, or in isolation. We have to partner on our campus, um, not only across colleges, uh, we have 17 colleges um, and uh, units like university libraries, uh, many more of those. Um, but we also have to collaborate across our departments, across central administration and so on. So it's also helpful to define what diversity means um, in an institution and uh, uh, in our institution also the current definition is quite broad. Um, we include uh, American Indians, people of color, um, people who identify as women, people with different sexual orientations. Um, we also address issues of access and climate um, on individuals who might encounter barriers based on their religious expression, age, national or origin, ethnicity, or veteran status. 
So this definition I often get asked about, you know, what do we define uh, as diversity? And I think it's important, but I also wanted to say that this is something that is a constantly evolving. Oftentimes we ask that question from the idea of that if we have some boxes that we can check, we can solve the problem. And I think uh, that's not going to actually happen. This is a constantly moving uh, definition, and we'll continue to have to uh, shift it as we learn and become more aware. Um, I'll also mention a couple initiatives uh, to implement this work. The first one is um, what we call College Made, and Made refers to multicultural access, diversity, and excellence. Uh, but it also refers to the fact that the, the whole, that whole initiative is made in the colleges. It's a, it's a partnership from um, sort of central administration and the colleges um, in which we look at data around the three priorities I mentioned. Um, you know, where are we at with representational diversity? Um, where are we at with the climate in that college as well as um, across our institution? And then what strategic partnerships and initiatives we're leveraging um, to advance our work. And so we, we meet with all of our 17 colleges over a period of an academic year to set goals and envision and take action at the college level. Um, in terms of data, much of this data is um, uh, you know, focused on race, ethnicity, and gender. We're expanding in this new cycle that we're beginning to disability and sexual orientation data as well. So uh, that whole process of, you know, uh, getting access to the data of our institutions and looking at it as Brian showed with this is really important because it, it brings everybody um, to awareness in, in ways that they might not have been and that becomes the starting point then to do our work. The second initiative is a diversity community of practice, and this is a grassroots community that involves staff, some faculty, and some administrators in a learning and action community around equity, diversity, and inclusion on the Twin Cities campus. It's not system-wide. We have five campuses across the state. Um, this meets monthly and has four committees, one on assessment, programming, communications, and the newest one is a policy review committee that offers feedback as part of the new equity lens process on university policies. Now the University Libraries is an active member of this diversity community of practice. Uh, one example of uh, the kind of work that emerges um, is the, the assessment committee that I just mentioned. Um, uh, this was a brainchild of that committee of uh, launching what we call a data diversity, diversity data deep dive. So the idea is that we take what we have in terms of diversity data, look at it, share it with others, and um, continue to do so and bring uh, speakers from across campus um, and different partners. And again, in that work too, we have partnered with the libraries. In fact. Um, as a result of the first event we had last fall, um, some librarians who attended the um, session said that they would like to partner because they have the data repository, um, uh, which could be used to actually share this diversity data across the institution, and also the digital conservancy and other things. So we're, we're continuing to explore, and that's the idea of con continuing to experiment and advance this work. Um, so from all of this work, I'll share a few insights What into what I think is critical to the advancing this work. Equity, diversity, and inclusion is everyone's everyday work. That's what we say um, in our office because um, it's not possible for just the leadership or just central administration to affect change. Certainly some decisions are being made at the leadership level, but if you take climate, that's happening in inter interactions between people but at every level. I mean, on campus you could have some microaggression in the cafeteria and it's affected the climate for individuals and that's not something you can mandate it's it's a it's a question of education so ongoing education is the second thing about um, these issues about your impact about identities um, and continuous learning is needed a practice aspect is really helpful too not only on the issues themselves but as I mentioned our willingness to look at our own identities our role and also commit to that work and then a recognition that we are in the continuing of past, present, and future. Um, because sometimes people wonder about, you know, I don't, you know, I, I am well-meaning, and so why is there some 
resistance against certain things, and it's coming from historical oppression in other contexts. So, you know, we are connected to the past, but at the same time, I feel in um, equity and diversity and inclusion work, we can get stuck in the past as well. It can be that, well, we don't know how to move forward. And so I think this is also about perhaps breaking as needed from the past and moving into the future. And that's where I think design thinking, so that's my segue into design thinking, because designers are focused on creating the future. Um, they do this sometimes by improving on the past in small increments, which I would call tweaking, um, or sometimes in big moves, um, moving away from the past, which I would call leaping. Um, in some instances, designers create something that hasn't been seen before and radically changes uh, how we experience the, the object or the world uh, and how it's perceived. And so design has that ability, so it makes sense to look at uh, design thinking then as a methodology as we are trying to do this work. So I'll transition now to talking more about design thinking. So a little bit of context. Uh, perhaps you've read um, uh, some of these books, um, Change by Design by Tim Brown, who is the um, CEO of IDEO, the design firm that actually was responsible in making design thinking very popular, um, I want to say, almost a decade ago, um, is something that you might want to look at. It's about changing organizations using design thinking. Another uh, book by Daniel, the author Daniel Pink, is very interesting because he talks about um, how we moved from an information age of which you all are experts um, to a conceptual age where we are trying to make meaning of things and we have more information at our fingertips and uh, in our you know, electronic um, gadgets than we can do you know, that, then we can handle. But really what's matter, what matters now is how do we make meaning and how do we take action. And then closer to home, um, Tom Fisher um, was for 19 years the dean of the College of Architecture. He still um, is there uh, running the Metropolitan Design Center. And he wrote a book called In the Scheme of Things. And um, as an architect trained, this was quite very influential on me. Uh, where it talked about um, the idea of um, design as a process, not just being about products, but being about designing anything and everything, from operation of a company to the organization of a community, everything can be approached as a design problem. And uh, that's something that uh, has been influential, and I think it's, it's at the core of the design thinking as an emerging field. So uh, what is design thinking? It's an emerging field of practice rooted in the tools and processes uh, traditionally employed by the design discipline. So certainly architecture, landscape architecture, graphic design, but there's more new emerging fields, um, uh, you know, uh, emerging that use design as its core process. The process of design thinking involves actions such as problem definition, field research, um, idea generation, storyboarding, prototyping, narrative and um, as a way to engage participa participants and motiv motivate creative action. And there are other fields that do, do that as well. I mean, engineering certainly has some of the same overlaps or you know, field research is common to many other disciplines. It's perhaps the combination of these tools and how it plays into design as a um, uh, methodology that makes it unique. Um, this is really referring to the fact that design for long and continues to focus a lot on, on products. So if we look around, everything in this space has been designed, including the building we're in. Um, in fact, this is my first experience being on the 50th floor of <laughs> the IDS tower. Um, so, uh, but at the, at the core of it, we often focus and think of design as a product-based um, you know, profession or you know, way of thinking, but it's really about the process. And that's what the field of design thinking, which is not just designers, it's many disciplines are involved in that field, um, engage with. Design thinking uses tools and methods to create something new or to refine and make better something that exists. 
And there's many aspects to design. It certainly seeks to function well, but it also seeks to delight, innovate, and create beauty. And so there's a lot of intangibles in design, which I think we need to keep in mind. And sometimes uh, when we talk about equity and diversity and inclusion, it becomes a very serious topic uh, because there's a lot of uh, serious things about it. But if we don't uh, keep that sense of uh, wanting to innovate, wanting to create beauty, want, wanting to uh, delight, you know, it's in, in, a, in a community sense. Um, I think we're missing the point. So I wanted to um, refer to the Stanford University and D schools process, and perhaps you've um, um, you know, seen it in other ways, but uh, empathy or empathize is the first step. So it's a five-step process, emp empathy or empathize, define, which refers to defining the problem, ideate, um, prototype, and test. So for um, maybe I should talk a little bit about it in terms of um, how designers think. Um, so when you start designing, you have to understand who you're designing for on a very deep level. You have to really um, sort of get into their shoes, so to speak, but also really understand what are their needs, what's their daily life, and depending on the thing that you're designing for them. If it's a house, then it would be about how they live, you know, what's the family, uh, what are their needs and aspirations and dreams. So there's a lot that goes into it. Um, so after a designer steeps themselves into that understanding, um, they then try to define of what is that problem that they're trying to solve for themselves, you know, f uh, meaning as a designer, what are, what are they trying to solve? So to put some words to it, some, uh, you know, create some specific concepts that they're trying to solve. And that's another important step. Then there is the ideation uh, part, and um, I think a lot of uh, us ideate. I mean, we do uh, brainstorming is one way to look at it. I think what makes um, ideation unique in, in the design context is that it's also visual. It's about drawing and sketching and uh, doing, expressing things in ways uh, maybe that engages the right brain and is not purely verbal as well. So that's different. Um, the fourth is prototyping, and certainly, again, we have in all of our disciplines the notion of a pilot, you know, that we create something and you pilot it. And that's, prototyping is related to that, uh, but prototyping is also about bringing into physical existence something in intangible ways. And we certainly know that in the, you know, car industry, like, you know that in the, a car that is finally sold on this, um, in the market has gone through a lot of prototyping and testing before it has got to that stage. So that idea of you know trying something, testing it, and then continuing to refine it. And so the test is also part of it. So these five steps are really iterative. So you could uh, start at one end and then go through all of them. But you can also go back at different points and immerse in any of those parts. And that's really um, important as well. You know, after, uh, somewhere along the designing the house process, they may come, a uh, designer might come back and say, okay, did I define the problem correctly? I completely left out their need for a garage or something like that, you know, <laughs> which would not go well. But, um, but, you know, sort of come and reconnect to different pieces of that and iterate again and so on. So that iteration mindset is also really important. So um, just quick things, user perspective is really important in the design um, thinking process. Learning about the user and putting yourself in the user's shoes is critical. And I'll mention this later as well, but uh, what, who are users in, when, when we're designing a system? And I see as everybody in the system. So uh, in the first design challenge that Brian mentioned, it's the leadership and the employees. So in higher ed, who are the users? Certainly the students who we focus on, but it's also the faculty and the administrators and the staff, all of us together co-create. It's a dynamic system. And if we focus just on one group of users, we um, tend to forget that we're all co-creating the system together, even though some users are at the receiving end maybe, and the others are more in the delivery end. You know. um, I just put this in there to rem a good reminder of empathy. You know. <laughs> um, gener ideation. So with ideation, generating many ideas is important. It's, it's about quantity. Uh, I have a colleague uh, in the College of Design who does um, toy design and product design. He, te he teaches that. 
Um, and um, his research uh, proves that it's basically not just uh, a few ideas. You want to really push yourself to get as many ideas out because the first ideas are the ones that are familiar to us. You know, you're kind of bringing up things that you're familiar with. But when you push yourself to do more, then you're actually getting to the more um, you know, unusual you know, and creative ideas. So m continue to generate as many ideas as you can. But then the second piece is drawing as well, you know, because I think we tend to uh, work with our verbal and our mental concepts. And when you start drawing things, there are some, uh, you know, subconscious, unconscious things that you that emerge. And I've, in many of the workshops that I've done, I've always noticed there's some spark there that you may not, if you only spoke about it, that you wouldn't see, but you draw about it. If you draw, it sort of comes up. Of course. Um, this is one of the areas where I realize how much baggage we all have about drawing and our creativity. You know, somewhere in grade school, we've been, we've been told that we are not good artists or we've told ourselves based on some feedback or just, you know, are critiquing our own work. And I think essentially that's one of the um, myths I feel that design thinking can explore that you know we're all creative and we just haven't used certain skills in cer other certain ways and so this is also about going back to tap those skills. So ideation is about drawing. Uh, prototyping is about making things visible. So even if it's a, a rough idea, you can make it visible by making, and making with things with. Um, is important. So thinking with your hands is a concept that um, designers are taught in school. You know, like uh, stop talking, start making, so that then we can see what ideas are emerging. So this is what I would call a low resolution prototype of a Fitbit. You know, it's made of felt and sewn together, but it's testing an idea and then it could lead to the next step. Um, so there's eight principles that we can keep in mind, especially as you start to apply these uh, principles of design thinking uh, and you bring groups together to um, work on creative ideas. First thing is embracing diversity in all forms. So can you bring people around the table that come from different viewpoints, from different ethnicities, from you know, different lived experiences um, as you're generating ideas? And radical collaboration, like uh, disciplines that don't otherwise mix, you know, bring them together. For example, um, I know there was a hackathon in San Francisco a few years ago where they brought homeless providers and tech gurus together, you know, and so that was not a group that worked together very often, and they kind of uh, exploded some problems and kind of solve them through that way. Making things visible is important. Mapping, um, I did a project with uh, the city of Minneapolis um, around homelessness, and the one thing we realized was that there isn't any map of where the homeless shelters are in the Twin Cities. And when you actually map them, you realize much, many of them are in downtown, and so it sort of raises questions about what if someone's homeless in the suburbs, you know, what happens, and where, where are the gaps, and all of that. So making things visible really is very revealing. Having empathy is very important. Um, this, I, uh, the next one I mentioned a little bit about having the creative confidence and if we're not comfortable to you know, lean into that discomfort and continue to explore that process. Having a bias for action. So I think that this perhaps may be one of the strongest things about design thinking that it's not really just about thinking, it's about acting and making things happen even if they're in idea form. Too often we get stuck in sort of what one of my colleagues says, admiring the problem and then going away. <laughs> so um, then, of course, being open to failing forward. And the reason sometimes we are afraid to act is that we're afraid of the failure that comes with it. Um, but if a space can be cr uh, created for failure to be acceptable and to be actually welcomed, as I think designers do, I mentioned the car industry too, they, they have experiments where they, there is Failure, you know, you're testing your things, you're expecting failure before it kind of is finalized. So creating that space is important. I know it's hard in the equity diversity context. You don't want to fail at somebody's expense, but you, there are other ways that you can think about it. And if it's a community, you can, uh, of diverse people working on these issues, you can actually uh, hold that space to do so. And then committing to iterative action. So I'll just mention a few more things. Who is the user? I think I mentioned this. Everyone in the system is, is the user. 
Uh, I also put in one of the questions we get is, is design thinking dead? Because there are, if you actually Google design thinking, you'll come across some of these articles that say design thinking is dead. So I think um, what I've observed that phenomena is that if you start off with thinking that design thinking should solve all your problems, I think that's an issue, you know. There is no one single tool or methodology or something that can solve all your problems. So if you start with recognizing it's a tool that can be used in combination with others, I think you're better off. And then the design thinking is dead concept, I think often comes right after right before somebody's trying to publish their next book or next concept. So it's important to kill something off before the other is born. So I think there's something there as well. And then in my own, with my own colleagues and my discipline and, you know, designers, I have heard pushback there as well about, you know, don't you think design thinking is in this way where everybody can, you know, come together, learn design through a workshop and so on, is um, watering things down. And um, I don't think so, because I think uh, our systems are created with complexity by many people involved, and the more people are you, that are using their creativity, the better it is for all of us. So we have to get down from our expert high horse as well to open the doors. That's sort of what I feel. So I think we're um, getting close to the time. So I'm going to just quickly run through a few slides. These are just um, visual glimpses of work we've done in different contexts uh, here as well as international. Um, and I did want to point out to this, maybe many of you know about this, but Design Thinking for Libraries and IDEO, the firm I mentioned, was involved. And um, it, there's a whole toolkit. Of course, it was planned with the idea about serving patrons and creating experiences for users of libraries. But I looked at their toolkit, and it's pretty robust, so you can frame design challenges, um, uh, you know, in any way. It sort of sets you in the process of framing it, and it was really done in a very thorough way, uh, funded by the Gates Foundation and so on. So here's the design challenges. We'll work on that in the next session. And in conclusion, I guess the few points uh, I have are, so address them using a creative design thinking mindset with empathy as the starting point. Start prototyping solutions, take iterative actions, and then I recommend trying the Design Thinking for Libraries toolkit. Share the results across your libraries and replicate um, eff effective model, and then begin applying it as soon as you can. So with that, I will invite Brian back for any Q&A that you might have for both of us. Thank you. Now the audience has questions. Yes. <laughs> Maybe you're used to being asked questions, not asking questions. Hi. Um, my name is Sarah Park-Dolan. I'm an associate professor at St. Kate's in the Library Science Program. We are the only ALA accredited program here in the state of Minnesota, so it's nice to see you nice across the river. Um, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I read the report with a lot of interest when it came out last year because I worked with Lee and Lowe to do the diversity baseline survey where we gathered information about the publishing industry and found how very white it was. And it's cited um, at the bottom of one of the pages in the Ithaca report. Um, so I was interested if you know anything or if anyone else can speak to your methodology. So what we did in the diversity baseline survey was we sent the survey to um, one person at each publishing company and we asked them to distribute it to their employees. So then we were able to ask questions about race, um, gender, the position that the person held at the company, um, sexual orientation and disability status. Um, and then I noticed in your report, you sent it to the director, who then sent it to human resources and had the human resources person fill it out. Is that correct? That's correct. OK. So just wondering, like, and I understand also that it was based um, on previous surveys that the foundation had also done. Um, so just wondering if there was discussion about um, distributing the survey in different ways so that you could also gather information about different characteristics such as sexual orientation, et cetera. Uh, 
uh, I have to say that I did not participate in the creation of the right. survey. I was just a survey participant. Right. However, it's noted in the report that mm -hmm. um, Ithaca did think about mm -hmm. the issue of surveying other employees besides the director mm -hmm. to get other perspectives, and that is an issue. Um, and I think I see one person who was involved in the creation of the survey, Francis Malloy. Do you want to say anything about that? Um, here, let me bring you the microphone. Yeah, oh. It was a couple years ago. Honestly, I don't know if I remember. Yeah, hi, I'm Francis Malloy I'm, um, at Union College, and I served on the committee, and is anybody else here who served on it? Maybe if we talk, chat, we could talk about it, but um, Mark? Oh, that's right, you did. Do you remember? Because I thought we did um, ask the question about gender, it, um, didn't we? I thought we did that, too. I thought we did that, too. Is it not there? I, I thought we did do um, sexual orientation. We didn't? It, it, was what, it was what HR collected. It was the issue. So maybe HR didn't collect that. Was that it? Oh, here. So yes, so. Can you hear? Hello? OK. So yes, there was considerable conversation around that and, um, and the fact that um, right, that a lot of those data are not typically um, collected by human resources um, personnel and, and what have you, you know, campus entities and what have you. So uh, the, they, they, there was some discussion at the end of the day. They decided a few things. One of them was to basically to duplicate or replicate, whatever the, prop, the <laughs> appropriate term is, uh, the methodology that was used in the study that was conducted, well, in several other sectors, the museum, uh, community, galleries, uh, that sort of thing, uh, so that there could be some baseline um, comparisons. So that was one of the thing, it, and, and, and the, just the, the trying to keep the bar for participation low, uh, and um, recognizing the complexities that would be involved if we, if if you collected the data uh, in using a different methodology, but so that that's from what I remember. This was a few years ago, so. <laughs> right, and I I think um, they were very intentional about the directors. They wanted yes. to look at that gap that Brian pointed out, yes. that what we thought and how great we are and the reality. So I think that was important, and then I think they wanted the directors because. You know, it was hard to get the data from HR. And that's why I think in some cases participation wasn't as high. It, I, I, I remember when, um, what's his name, Schoenfeld, what's his first name? Roger. Roger, Roger. sorry. When he presented at uh, the Oberlin Group, um, he mentioned how some ARL libraries had to like, you know, not sue, but like really like, mm. come on, we need this data. Like it was a pain. They had to really work hard and work through legal and uh, probably those ARL directors here can talk about that. So it was not easy to get. And then when, when we talked about it at the Oberlin Group, um, the other concern was, which I always get from institutional assessment people, what are you going to use the data for? You know, that suspicion of, you know, and so, and that's, you know, a huge challenge. So. If I could add to that, um, on, at the institutional, it's not libraries focused, but at the institutional level, it's uh, our experience is the same. The institutional assessment doesn't necessarily have disability res related data. And so we're working with our disability resources center and seeing what their experience and records are. Um, and then also getting um, s um, sexual orientation data through some national surveys that are focused on student experiences across research universities, of which our universities are part. So it's a little bit of uh, ex experimental data gathering. Thank you. So actually, um, Irene Harold, I'm now at the College of Worcester, but when we did the survey, I was at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And, um, my experience with it really colors my feelings about the survey. So I just uh, feel strongly that we need to remember it's an indication of trends from those that responded and not necessarily a comprehensive view of the situation, but it's an indication. Uh, my experience was that Roger actually personally contacted me three times to harass me to get the data. <laughs> And I had a terrible time getting it. Um, uh, particularly, Human Resources was not willing to share many of the categories that were deemed important to have. For example, veteran. Were you a veteran or not? They don't collect that, and they were not willing to allow us to ask anyone 
Um, and the other one was the differentiation among the Asian Pacific Islanders. And you know, in Hawaii, that's kind of big. Uh, just to comment on that, yet you know, what you all underscore are the sort of limit data limitations of the report. It's really, as you said, Irene, it's an indicator, and it's certainly not representative. Um, and I would love to see a representative uh, uh, survey and report, uh, and that which could be building on the things that we've been bringing up here, such as the issues of attrition. I mean, uh, attrition has been talked about. Anecdotally, in our social media and our literature, the attrition of people of color who are librarians or other professionals, but where's the data on that? Um, and I think that would be a really powerful element to add to a more comprehensive and perhaps more valid survey, uh, valid for the larger uh, numbers of us. Hi, this is, my name is Renna Red. I'm at Clemson University. This is not a question, this is more of an FYI for everyone. There are two librarians from Reed College who have done a lot of work on using <laughs> design thinking for libraries. Their names are Joe Marquez and Annie Downey, and you can find some of their resources on the ALA website. So we can take these concepts and we don't have to reinvent the wheel <laughs> to translate them into librarianese. We can yeah. use that. So. It's out there. Yeah. Thank you so much. We have 10 more minutes. We have 10 more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe I'll just say something about the related to the survey. So um, while the comprehensive survey is a challenge for various factor uh, reasons, um, there may be ways in smaller ways to g gather information through your libraries, you know, and other methods as well. I, I do feel in um, diversity assessment, uh, a lot of emphasis is given to the quantitative and not as much to the qualitative. That's one of the issues as well. And so sometimes I feel like our institutions spend a lot of effort in working on the next best instrument and uh, the next best survey. Meanwhile, we don't know what is happening on some level. Um, and we can ask and we can um, you know, have qualitative ways and small scale ways. So we're having our colleges and so on to do some focus groups uh, around climate um, and retention and so on. And then that's yielding you know, a much better sense uh, at the college level as well. So I think I'm not saying that we don't need these um, excellent instruments across our institutions, but we can also do something in the meantime and not wait for the perfect survey. So I had a question about, um, I like the idea of creating an object and having something tangible to help us focus on what are the important bits and what's it feel like? Is it soft? Is it hard? Is the, does it have edges? Um, and so I'm thinking about that in terms of ideas, right? So when we talk about making changes in our libraries to do with DEI, um, those are ideas rather than tangible objects like a chair or a microphone or whatnot. So <clears throat> I'm trying to think through a process whereby maybe in our libraries when, if we were to use this method for helping folks think about um, how to um, how to be more inclusive in our libraries. And we use this tool to help people brainstorm, if you will, uh, and work through the process. What types of things, like when you get to the point where you're making something, like what kinds of examples do you have where you're, you're um, making something that's an idea? Maybe you can give some examples of that. That's a great question. Um, I think a lot of people are not clear about, you know, what could you, because many of these things are intangible and, you know, they're not necessarily products that we're talking about. Um, I think the thing to, at the core of this is that you're really triggering your thinking process even when you're making. 
But maybe I should back up and say that even in, des in the design context, um, making things is in two modes. One is representation. So it could be that you have a very clear idea and you're trying to represent it. So you make something that shows as accurately as you can what your idea is. But the second is more explorative, you know, where you're playing around with materials while mulling on a design problem and em seeing what emerges, you know, as you're playing around. You know, I, I mean, maybe people have used Play-Doh and, you know, you can be doing things and things are forming in your hand without necessarily being intentional about it. And it's, I think I'm referring more to the second process as the way uh, where you have a design challenge and uh, we will, you know, articulated some ones here, um, but you're playing with materials as you're thinking deeper about it, have gone, thought through with empathy, defined what the problem is, ideated, and then you're playing around with materials to see what emerges and how you can advance that idea or narrow from the many ideas you've generated into something that emerges. And it's actually quite magical. And I think um, it's hard if you haven't practiced it necessarily to think, how, how's this going to work or does it, will it work? But it does work, so you, there's a little bit of trust the process, which is not always you know, fun to enter into. And I think people do get uncomfortable because we don't know where this is leading. But that's also an exercise, I think, that's useful to, to kind of work with your discomfort in the creative process and then come out with some solutions. So I don't know if that's helped, but. So you have a bunch of libraries playing, doing play, working with play Play-Doh. Well, this afternoon, I think we're going to stop at the ID8 because, you know, we need about three to four um, hours to do the full design thinking and even in a compressed way. And so we, we kept it to just the ID8 here. Yeah. So um, I have a survey question. And uh, I was really happy to see disability listed on the survey. And so part of my question, or maybe all of my question is, how did we gather that data? How is disability defined? Um, as well as, you know, what is the distribution of people with disabilities across library land? Um, and what does that mean for diversity, equity, um, inclusion, and all that kind of stuff? Thanks very much. As, again, uh, a participant in the survey, but not the creator of it. I'm going to ask those who worked on it, was it Mark Puente and Francis to address that? I did not see any data, demographic data about disability in there, just attitudinal data about what library directors thought of uh, issues of diversity as related to, is that correct? So um, again, because HR departments, I assume, are not collecting that data on a uniform basis and reporting it, and it's optional. Okay, thank you. But that's an important thing for us to consider. As, and again, the, the report f focused uh, on racial and ethnic diversity because that's the data that we have. But that doesn't, again, my opinion, my, my take on it, that doesn't exclude the validity of examining other kinds of diversity, disability, sexual orientation, uh, veteran status, religion. Um, all those are really foremost in my mind, I think, as, as next steps for us. Um, can I just add something? Um, I mentioned that we are trying to um, identify um, data around disabilities uh, for our next cycle working with colleges. And we're, when we've uh, start, started the process, we've talked to the Disability Resources Center, and what we're trying to identify is um, the people or the, the students, uh, staff and faculty from each college that is accessing disability resource services. And we already know that's probably 50% of the people who actually have disabilities that access those services. And then we're starting to identify what kinds of disabilities um, are you know, at play. And again, this is not happening through HR, so I just wanted to mention. So I hesitated to get up here to talk a bit about the design thinking process that we did at the University of Arizona in our library around strategic planning. And so I don't want to do a disservice to my colleagues who ran an incredible process for us, and it took months. We started back, I want to say, um, early September. And we are now in the process of sort of looking at the work that we've done th through several months. And so what we did was essentially called for volunteers to participate in this process. And we had about 114 people out of a 
our library that's about 118 employees to agree to, to be a part of this process, which was, I think, pretty incredible to start with. So we had 14 teams, and we looked at how we wanted to, as a library, uh, respond to how we work with students, how we work with faculty, um, and community users, et cetera. So we had certain areas that we were focusing on, and the teams had to look at, first we did a scan of the environment, we actually went out and talked to students, and we talked to faculty, and we did focus groups, we did tiny cafes, and we did some surveying, we did observational um, uh, studies in our libraries, kind of sat with the students and watched them, you know, and took notes, and we brought this information together and we made notes, and then we did a prototype of what that student could look like. That was the IDA project. And at the very end, what we ended up doing was developing a, proto a prototype using the idea of what the campus president is all about right now, and he's really pushing this idea of the fourth industrial revolution. So for some of us, we're like, oh, what is that? You know, go do your research and get behind it and learn what that was. And so it was really looking at what, you know, where we're, at, where we're going um, with technology and this kind of thing. So the fun process was being able to sit around and sort of look back at what we had collected in terms of data information and what we were looking at in terms of our prototype. And then we actually got to get our hands on. So we had pipe cleaners and, you know, concern that was like being back in grade school, you know. But I think the best part of, and our group, we ended up doing a, a robot that would actually work with students and, and get them to the places that they needed to go that would address like simple reference questions and directional questions and these kinds of things. Um, but also, you know, working with Starbucks and actually having coffee on the robot to serve them as they're going, being led to, you know, special collections or something like that. So um, the best part, I think, for me personally as an organization was being able to have staff, faculty, administrators all work on these projects through a course of four or five months and the kinds of relationships and the working that you were able to do, but also to inform that, what the end product. So, I mean, I totally am a big proponent of um, the design thinking and we had an outside consultant, Alicia Bate, who's in Chicago, I forget the name of her actual, and she's a one man, oper one person operation. So she, um, she helped us facilitate that process. And so from there, we're gonna work on our strategic plan, so. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and hope others can talk to you more. I would certainly like to hear more. Um, I think th you made a very important point about the, it's almost like the process and what it leads to is one thing, but the relationships along that. And I think I didn't clearly mention that, but I think this is moving from the idea that a few people in the hierarchy at the top have the answers to everything, right? So this is about tapping wisdom from everybody who's involved in the system. And that doesn't often happen, and that's why if we can use processes like this to gain that wisdom that's in the system and then use it to create the solution, it's a much better solution. Okay, I think we've reached our time for the break. I'm sure everybody's looking forward to that. If you're interested in working through design practices, come back to this room at 3.30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.